And worldview. Good day, everybody. Andy White here. What you are about to hear is the fusion of heart, mind, and soul. I want to welcome everybody from all across the fruited plain and all around the spherical globe. Thanks for tuning in to this week's edition of Open Up the Doors. And I am streaming live, as is my habit, over at the Open Up the Doors Facebook page over on Facebook.com slash FaithFM91.7. Go on over there. Please like the page if you've never liked the Facebook page and join in the, the conversation and the fellowship over there. Let me know where you are watching from all across the fruited plain and all around the spherical globe. I, If you'd like to follow me uh, outside of Facebook, I know a lot of people kind of gave up on Facebook a long time ago, but it's been a great platform for these videos. But you can follow me on Truth, the Truth Social Network at AJ White. And the, uh, the the network there is growing. The fellowship there is growing. The friendships over on Truth Social are growing. So look me up if you are on Truth Social at AJ White. If you are outside of the Faith FM broadcast area, the best way to listen to Faith FM is to download the free Faith FM app. We have the app for both the Android platform and the Apple platform. Uh, you get it at your respective uh, app dealer. Uh, look up Faith FM in Sag Harbor. And you'll get the right Faith FM because there are several around the country that use the same moniker. Anyway, look it up there. Faith FM Sag Harbor. Uh, and, of course, we are streaming all across the Internet, but which is why it's the, 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 uh, the app is such a great, a great thing to have as we broadcast here on the east end of Long Island. You know, you could be living outside of the, uh, the Faith FM broadcast area. I do plan on going to the phones in the second hour if you'd like to call in and i would love to hear from you and have you uh voice your 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 questions your input your comments uh the phone number is 631-725-2069 write that down and i'll open up the phones in the second hour we can discuss the topic at hand or anything you'd like to discuss 631-725 2069 so i think that pretty much gets through the preliminaries that i want to get to at the moment but i want to in this broadcast this week take a take a look at several reports uh regarding some things that have been flying under the radar for most of us and we're not really hearing much about these things or even if we are Many of us tend to dismiss them as having no relevance to our daily lives. But the things I'm going to talk to you about today, folks, please don't ignore or be dismissive of these things. Because in the days and weeks and months ahead, they will all very much affect all of our lives. And though, again, most of us don't pay much attention to some of these things, these things are very important. That's why I bring them to this to this platform. That's why I talk about them on this platform and on this on, on this broadcast because these things are very important, both geopolitically and prophetically speaking. And there's the there's the connection: geopolitical and prophetical. The prophetically uh, movements, the, the the maneuverings of men and nations that that God is using to bring about His purposes. 
And these things will have, they're already having, but they will have great ramifications on our lives up ahead in the not too distant future. So that's why I bring them forth. That's why I talk about them. That's why I, I delve into some things that, that people may not be hearing on a, on a you know, daily basis from, from our mainstream news media. And even from some of our pulpits, I, I need to tell you, it's really a constant refrain that I hear from people all the time. I listen to you because you're talking about the things I'm not hearing uh, uh, from, you know, in my church. And that's okay. I understand church, church pulpits and pastors have, have different uh, priorities and different uh, focuses, and that's legitimate. But that's why God raises up a platform like this, so that we're all working together uh, to bring forth the, the full counsel of God and to, to feed the sheep and to, to nurture the body of Christ. But today I'm going to be talk, talking, excuse me, talking about some of these reports regarding the, the WHO, the World Health Organization, and the UN, some of the things that they're going to be embarking on in the, within the months and the, in the next year, really. But I'm also going to be talking about MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, commonly known as NBS, the up-and-coming king of Saudi Arabia. Right now, he's the crown prince, but his dad, his dad is very old, and, and it, it will be pretty soon that MBS will be in full control, even though he's pretty much in control now, really. But I'm going to be talking a little bit about, about him and what the Saudis are doing th- through MBS. And there's also a new report out that I just stumbled upon the other day that I want to touch upon regarding who the successor who the successor to Recep Erdogan, who is the current president dictator of Turkey, who is his, his successor might be, which is something I talked about a few years ago and something that I had suggested and suspected. But all of these overlapping machinations and agendas, here is the point. They're all a vying for dictatorial power on the world stage. And all of these things in, in, in their various forms and parts are simply the march towards the final Satan-possessed despot who is to come. And all the pieces of the puzzle are being assembled right in front of our eyes, brothers and sisters, for the final manifestation of the would-be world dictator. And some of the things I'm going to talk to you about today later on in the broadcast are logistics, infrastructure systems and structures because those four words logistics infrastructure systems and structures are very important yet very few people when it comes to end time prophecy ever think about the logistics of the prophetic scriptures in other words the things that must happen and take place before other things can happen and take place in order for prophecy to to be fulfilled. For example, real quickly, before I get into these reports, in the context of of this discussion and where it's heading, let me plainly state at the outset that the Antichrist doesn't just pop on the scene out of the clear blue sky and start branding people with 666, as many seem to suggest and think. But when that final dictator, that ultimate dictator arises the infrastructure system and the geopolitical structures will already be in place this is an important part that people seem to like completely ignore the antichrist doesn't create them he simply takes control of them and utilizes them to their fullest potential under his authority and satanic power and i'm going to elaborate on that a little bit later But I want to look at some of these things right now that are going on. For example, let's take a look at what the UN and the WHO are up to. And these things will affect us in the very near future because they are working to implement this agenda by this time, September, this is August to August, by this time next year, they plan on having this uh, agenda of theirs, this pandemic preparedness treaty ratified and put in place. What is the WHO up to? I'm, and I'm going to say WHO, because that's their acronym, the World Health Organization. I'm going to say WHO for the rest of this broadcast to save time. 
But in late May of 2024, which is basically, you know, nine months away or so, in May of 2024, the, the WHO is going to get an unprecedented amount of power, an infusion, if you will, of power through what is being called, quote, the Pandemic Preparedness Treaty. And I don't know how many people have heard about this, but it's already in the works. The Pandemic Preparedness Treaty is essentially a health dictatorship with nations, including America, surround, uh, surrendering their sovereignty over to the WHO regarding health care decisions. The WHO, not the rock band, the World Health Organization. I'm sorry, I can't help myself. I have to slip these things in there. <laughs> the WHO will find it within their purview to mandate, oh, you're going to love this, they're going to mandate, basically by their own volition and whims, but they're going to find it under their jurisdiction and purview to mandate lockdowns, masks, vaccines, and control the flow of information and whatever other dra uh, draconian actions they, they deem they deem as necessary. Not what your local governor might deem as necessary, or our country, but what they deem as ne necessary in this pandemic preparedness treaty. In a global health crisis, they will exert authority over sovereign nations. In the word, and here's where it gets even more interesting. If, if that wasn't interesting enough, it gets even more interesting. In the wording of this pandemic preparedness treaty, they can even plan for things that aren't health care related, but they'll deem them as being, well, it's kind of sort of maybe a little bit like health care, such as climate change or psychological issues like gender issues, as well as setting up surveillance and censorship of quote-unquote disinformation. According to the current version of the treaty, the WHO will not even have to provide information to the member nation states about pandemics that are ongoing or health risks. They can keep that information uh, um, apart, uh, separate from our own um like CDC, although that's probably not such a bad idea anyway. I see CDC is a mess anyway, but I won't digress. But the WHO will only have to provide them with the orders. In other words, they'll only have to provide nations, let's say America, with the orders on what we are being told we must do. Now, that is their plan at any rate. How they would enforce compliance remains to be seen, especially with us red-blooded Americans who aren't going to go for this nonsense. But break out the popcorn, folks, because this is what they are planning. But to make matters even worse, now this pandemic preparedness treaty is to be um, agreed upon and implemented beginning of, as I said, May 24. But then in September 2024, uh, basically a year from now, the United Nations intends to take further and complete control with what they're calling the Pact for the Pact for the Future initiative, which is an emergency platform treaty. Now, the WHO has already launched a social listening surveillance program, which is being powered by AI. According to a an article an article written by a guy named Alex Gutentag, this article he, he posted on, 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 on X, the platform formerly known as Twitter. But uh, Alex Gutenberg wrote uh, 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 an article called World Health Organization Pushes Sweeping Censorship Treaty. You see, the pandemic treaty is a censorship treaty to control the flow of information amongst nations. And he writes this, and I'm going to just quote from his article. Few organizations have done more to promote the idea that governments should censor disfavored views of COVID policies than the World Health Organization, which calls health-related dissent and debate an infodemic. 
We don't want these people speaking out things that we don't approve of. But WHO leaders view disfavored views, in other words, differences of opinions, as a disease to be eradicated rather than as a fundamental human right to be protected. In this new investigation, uh, it's been revealed that a coordinated effort, a coordinated effort by the WHO to use future medical crises as an excuse for sweeping censorship. Instead of trying to rebuild public trust after COVID-19, the WHO is attempting to enshrine, and I'll say double down, on some of the worst abuses of state power from the last three years. You think they would have learned their lessons. No, they're going to double down on it, my friends. This is in the plan within the next 12 months. Among some of the amendments in this draft treaty, the amendments will also give the WHO supranational powers. Now, it's funny. When I first when I was first reading this article, I thought it said they will be given supernatural powers. I was like, I, 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 what, what? What do you mean to give them supernatural powers? I misread it. My, my eyes played a trick on me. But the amendment will give the WHO supranational powers. Powers. In other words, they will require medical treatments, examinations, and quarantines to be mandated over and above sovereign nations. That's called tyranny. That's called a dictatorship. That is called something that will might as well just blow up and burn our Constitution. Again, I'm going to be very curious to see how this is going to get all implemented out. They've got these grandiose ideas. How are they going to, to uh, enforce them remains to be seen. Now, I know there, there are a lot, of, a, a lot of sheep nations out there, like Australia, Australia will, will, will jump in, you know, hook, line, and sinker, and some European nations, not all. There'll be some, some resistance from countries like, uh, like probably Poland and Hungary. But, uh, but this is kind of going to, I think, open up a, another can of, of, of worms that I'll get to later on in the broadcast, the infighting amongst these, these things. But again... These plans are made even more alarming by the WHO's recent adoption of the uh, European Union's digital health care, digital health certificate system. During COVID, the Europeans had set up a digital system which was used by all European Union member states to prevent, if you might remember, prevent unvaccinated people from crossing borders. They couldn't fly. They couldn't they couldn't even cross uh, Borders like we couldn't cross states under uh, from from New York to New Jersey to Pennsylvania during during COVID uh, when we were locked down in quarantines in Europe they they actually had these these uh, these digital health certificates you got to show like a like a passport uh, but many countries use these health certificates to also prohibit unvaccinated people from accessing restaurants bars gyms stadiums you know basically public places. Now, the WHO is planning to expand that power to restrict and censor members of the public, despite the fact that we've all found out in the aftermath of all of that nonsense that much of what social media platforms and governments deem to be, quote unquote, misinformation about COVID, we were were entirely right and entirely true, but they don't care about the truth. Facebook admitted to censoring often true information about vaccine vaccine side effects, while Stanford Internet Observatory's Virality Project encouraged Twitter and other social media platforms to do the same. So, again, this pandemic treaty is supposed to come into force in May of 2024. And then in September 2024, as I alluded to a moment ago, the U.N. intends to take it further and have complete control with what they're calling a pact for the future emergency platform. Right off the UN website, I'm going to read it right off the UN website, quote, the summit of the future, which they plan on having, I believe, in September of next year, the summit of the future is a -a once-in-a-generation opportunity to enhance cooperation on critical challenges and address gaps in global governance. We got a gla- we got a gap in global governance. Uh, those Americans really aren't getting on board. A lot of those a lot of those rogue redneck Americans who are who live in flyover country they're not getting they're not getting on the train here. That's I'm reading in between the lines. They don't say that, but they want to uh, 
have a conference to address critical challenges. They consider freedom and democracy and uh, inst- uh, constitutional republic. They consider that as a critical challenge, and they want to address that gap in global governance. You see where this is going? They want to reaffirm existing commitments, including sustainable development goals, SDGs, and different things that they've been trying to to put forth, uh, uh, really all in uh, in the direction of their Agenda 2030. This is all wrapped up in this, in this whole thing. But they want to basically uh, double down on the commitments of the member states of the UN, of which, of course, America is part of. In an article in the Federalist, which really went through all of this, the stuff that they're planning, these treaties, an article in the Federalist, I'll, I'll post that in the stream at, one, at some point later today, but they really did an analysis, uh, ana- an analysis, excuse me, but they aptly stated some of these things, and they summed it up this way, that these things that the UN are, are, are going to propose, and they're really more than proposals, they're ready to implement them. But the, the, uh, the article in the Federalist stated it this way, quote, the proposal might be the biggest attempted power grab in the history of the United States. If approved, the United States as we know it could cease to exist. That's a heavy statement. I'll read it again. The proposal might be the biggest attempted power grab in the history of the United Nations. If approved, the United States as we know it could cease to exist. The, the UN plan for a, quote, emergency platform is a stunning proposal to give the UN significant powers in the event of future, quote, unquote, global shocks, such as another worldwide pandemic, or basically really anything that they decide is is, is an emergency. They're going to really basically uh, say, well, you know what? We think this is an emergency. We're going we're gonna to clamp down on, on your freedoms and we're taking control. Once triggered, I was, this was an interesting statement here that I caught, that I, that I wanted to zero in on because we just had a little bit of an example of, of the insanity of this over in Maui in, in the wildfires. But listen to this from the Federalist. Once triggered, the emergency platform would give the UN the ability to, quote, actively promote and drive an international response, now listen to this, that places the principles of equity and solidarity at the center of its work. Let me give you a little bit of example of what placing the principles of equity in the center of uh, emergency decisions might look like, because we just had an example of it. There was this guy in Maui, uh, I, I forgot what agency he was in, but he was, he was in the government. Might have might have been uh, what was uh, obviously a re, a part of the response agencies. Anyway, this guy in Maui refused to divert and release an emergency flow of water from the streams into the reservoirs in order to fight the wildfires because quote these are his words he needed time to consider whether it was an equitable response and usage of water seriously folks did you hear about this this guy waited five hours before he diverted uh they they had they had to get to these to these uh they had to get to these substations in order to divert water from streams into the reservoir so they could fight the wildfire they were running out of water and this guy said no he had to consider the equity of it all by the time five hours went by by the time he said okay we can do it the 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 machinery and the substations that they needed to 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 operate were destroyed by the fire so these people are nuts they in the midst of a in the midst of a a, 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 a a calamity in the midst of a catastrophe in the midst of an emergency they want to consider what's uh, equitable and sustainable uh, it, it's just it's mind boggling but this emergency platform would give the united states that kind of power to ensure quote that all participating actors make commitments that can contribute meaningfully meaningfully to the response and that they are held to account for delivery on those commitments. By the way, that's code for they want to tax and take your money 
my fellow Americans. They want us to pay for it. All right, I'm, I'm getting long in this first block. And I want, I want to move this along. I will say one thing about all of this before I take a break. Again, they want to put this emergency uh, platform, this emergency treaty together. What kind of a global shock would trigger the emergency platform? The UN provides several possible examples in its formal proposal, including a major climate event, future pandemic risks, risks a global digital c- connectivity disruption, in other words, a cyber attack, a major event in outer space, and unforeseen risks, in other words, black swan events. Basically, put in simpler terms, a global shock amounts to whatever the UN's leadership says it is, triggered whenever the UN desires. And the Biden administration and this current president supports all of this. Rather than assert America's independence and sovereignty, the writer in the Federal says, and I agree 100%, rather than assert America's independence and sovereignty, the White House has expressed its support for the emergency platform. U.S. Ambassador Chris Liu noted in the last, in at least two speeches recently that the Biden administration backs the emergency platform along with mu- numerous other proposals included in the U.N. Our Common Agenda platform folks if this emergency platform is approved the united states as we know it could cease to exist as a democratic republic i know that sounds dire but it's true i'll be back with more stick around here's chris tomlin king of glory You are the King of Glory. Love that tune by Chris Tomlin, King of Glory. Welcome back. Andy White here on the radio, tearing down strongholds. You are listening to Open Up the Doors, Integrity and Broadcasting here on Faith FM, WEGB 90.7 and 93.3 in Epic, and WEGQ 91.7 in Quag. And I'm just going to get back into my uh, stream and flow of consciousness here. Move move this football down the field a little bit more, leaving the WHO behind. Let's move on over to Saudi Arabia. And what is Mohammed bin Salman been up to lately? And there have been reports, this is very interesting, that Saudi Arabia, through Mohammed bin Salman, has been secretly negotiating with Israel. And at the beginning of August, this past month, Benjamin Netanyahu signaled that a deal was close to being done with Mohammed bin Salman, a.k.a. MBS. And I'll start just saying MBS for short, save some little bit of precious seconds here on the broadcast. But these reports are saying that Saudi Arabia is signaling that it's going to strike an unprecedented peace deal with Israel. Now, as you all, I'm sure know, during the Trump administration, a number of Arab nations uh, signed on to what we have come to be called the Abraham Accords. But Saudi Arabia was not one of them at the time. But now it appears that the secret negotiations between MBS and Netanyahu may be successful and that the Saudis will be joining the Abraham Accords in large measure, and I find this very interesting, in large measure in order to provide protection both for the Saudis and Israel against the aggression of, listen to this, both Turkey and Iran. Both Turkey and Iran are countries that hate both Israel, of course, and the Saudis. And I think this is prophetically significant, by the way, inasmuch as Turkey and Iran are the two main axis powers of the Magog Confederacy. And they get into a battle. The king of the south will eventually attack the king of the north, which is the, the, the Antichrist, the Magog Confederacy. And the king of the north will defeat the king of the south. We read about that in Daniel 11. But the king of the south is most likely a coalition between Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And it's a coalition that is already essentially established because of their cooperation in building a causeway, a causeway across the Gulf of Aqaba that will connect Neom with Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. 
So there's already this, this uh, again, this alliance, this uh, uh, economic uh, agreement between Egypt and Saudi Arabia, the kings of the south. But aside from this protection, this mutual defense pact, so to speak, I'm, they're not calling it that, but why would, why would MBS want to make a deal with Netanyahu like this? Because, well, for one thing, He's looking to be the top Muslim leader in the world. And he's doing this at the same time that Erdogan, president of Turkey, is looking and wants to be the top Muslim leader in the world. Which, again, is in itself intriguing. Because according to Daniel 11, the king of the north comes against the king of the south and defeats him. And I'll say it again because I want it to sink in. Which, generally speaking, is Egypt. But it would could also include Saudi Arabia. And interestingly enough, Egypt and Saudi Arabia are not part of the Magog Confederacy of Ezekiel 38 and 39, which I've talked about many times in the past. But they would be the part of the group of nations, Egypt and Saudi Arabia. They're part of the group of nations that have a peace treaty already in existence with Israel. This plays into uh, some things that I'll get into further down the pike here but getting back into this intriguing treaty with saudi arabia and all the geopolitical maneuverings it entails this possible peace treaty between saudi arabia and israel would have as i've just explained significant prophetic ramifications not the least of which would probably also give mbs some much needed additional funding for his futuristic Tower of Babel city. Something I've talked about, again, many times in the past. Bear in mind that I have shared several times over the years that MBS is kind of like a modern-day Nimrod of sorts, who at this very moment is engaged in building this super city state of Neom, which may very possibly, and I'll emphasize possibly, not saying it is, but possibly might be Mystery Babylon in the making. This city that of Neom may very well become possibly the capital city of the Antichrist for a season when he rises to power, before he moves his capital to Jerusalem, and then he himself, who is the beast, will destroy Mystery Babylon. Remember again, Mystery Babylon rides on the back of the beast in Revelation at the first at the first, Mystery Babylon and the Beast Kingdom, they're in a, they are in an alliance at first, each using the other for its own nefarious purposes. But the Beast actually hates this harlot and will burn her with fire. So what exactly are the Saudis proposing as regards a defense pact or this treaty? Well, the Saudis have publicly stated they won't agree to anything in this deal unless it provides a homeland for the Palestinians. If it doesn't, then no deal. If Israel doesn't agree to divide their land and give some of it to the Palestinians, some of it, then the Saudis say no deal. And in this way, Mohammed bin Salman thinks he can rise to the top of the Islamic world by finally getting a deal done regarding a Palestinian state. So back in the beginning of August, as I mentioned a moment ago, Netanyahu announced that he would be willing to make concessions to the Palestinians in order to get a Saudi deal done. Oh, the maneuverings and machinations of men and nations. Are only the predetermined prophetic determinations of the living God. But here's something that's very intriguing about this aspect of this Saudi-Israeli deal and how it would, and where and how it would create this quote-unquote Palestinian state. What, they, what they're talking about doing is they're talking about creating this Palestinian state within Jordan. Within Jordan. What's funny about that is that really was the original proposal by the Balfour Declaration but then it was rejected by the Arabs back in 1948 when Israel became a, became a nation. It was supposed to be in, in, in Jordan. It was called Transjordan back then. But it was, re, but it was rejected. And now they're saying, okay, well, basically they're saying, okay, let's go back to the original plan. 
All you, all you Palestinians, remember, Palestinians aren't a real thing. They're Arabs. They were mostly Jordanians at the time. But here's the thing right now, not to reiterate all that and revisit all that. Israel already basically has a treaty with Jordan. And they trust the king of Jordan to a certain extent for the most part. And here is an even more intriguing aspect of this MBS proposal. The king of Jordan is officially the one who's in charge of the Temple Mount. So this deal, if it goes through, could possibly bring about Israeli access to the Temple Mount. Maybe, maybe even the beginning of the rebuilding of the Temple, which would, of course, be huge. So it's something to certainly keep our eyes upon. Let's talk about for a moment and add some more political intrigue into the mix. Turkish President Recep Erdogan has repeatedly said that Turkey is the only country that can lead the Muslim world. So what is the caliph, that the caliph wannabe Turkish President Erdogan up to? Well, he knows he's getting old. Technically, constitutionally, he can't run for re-election a- anymore in, in Turkey, although he changes that all the time. But he knows he's also getting old. Now, as many of you know, I've been following, who have been following me through the years, you know that I've done many, many broadcasts looking at this Turkish president, Erdogan, regarding his aspirations to revive the Ottoman Empire and to be the leader, the caliph of a revived Ottoman Empire, an Islamic caliphate, which I do believe will be the kingdom, the ten-horned king, kingdom of, make, of, of Ezekiel 38 and 39, the ten-horned beast of, of, of Daniel 7, the ten-horned beast of Revelation. I believe it will be that ca- the Islamic caliphate that will rise again. But I've often said that Erdogan has certainly antichrist type of ambitions and characteristics, but that logistically things aren't quite there yet. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit. But I believe he was setting things up for his successor. About two or three years ago, I felt led to do a little research on his son, Bilal, who was basically pretty obscure on the world stage. And I did this research, and I, after I looked at it, I, I said to myself, and I remember mentioning it on a broadcast once, I said, I think that there could be a very strong possibility that Erdogan would try and raise up his son Bilal to take his place and pursue his ambitions and aspirations. And lo and behold, just the other day, I stumbled by accident across an article that says this. This is the title. Turkish President Erdogan is grooming his youngest son, Bilal, to succeed him, the report says. Ah, I feel like I should have worn my shirt today. Told you. I got a shirt at home that says told you. Turkish, I'm going to read from the article. Turkish President Recep Erdogan is tr- is troubled by growing health problems and has initiated plans to groom his son, Nejmetin Bilal. Now, his middle name is Bilal. His, his first name is Nejmetin, but they call him Bilal. That's, they just commonly call him Bilal. Bilal Erdogan. Bilal, he's basically anointing to succeed him, according to an analysis by investigative journalist Abdullah Bazkat, who I've actually quoted quite a bit on this broadcast over the years. The analysis in the reports suggest that Erdogan aims to create a family dynasty while dismantling democratic institutions in Turkey against the backdrop of a weak opposition and amassing and his amassing of a vast family wealth estimated to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Bilal, though not holding any public office, is considered the most influential person in Turkey's governance. And he operates basically from the shadows, aided by his father's repressive rule and extensive network of cronies in key government positions. The f- report further states that, I'll use his whole name, Nejmetin Bilal Erdogan. Now, I looked up what his name means in, in Turkish and Arabic you know, b- baby names. His name, Nejmetin, his first name, comes from an Arabic name meaning the star of Islam. And Bilal means chosen one. So, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. His name means the star of Islam, the chosen one. Bilal Erdogan was nurtured 
in an Islamic religious school and educated in the U.S. He is an ideological zealot devoted to the ideology of political Islam. He maintains close ties with religious sects, uh, Muslim sects, and networks that support his father's rule and political agenda. It's also been reported that he's worked with, uh, and he's worked and associated with Al Qaeda financers. The analysis raises concerns about the potential future direction of Turkey's political landscape. We we'll just need to read the Bible to find that one out. Let me cut to the quick here because I'm running out of time. But the bottom line is this. Let's let me see where da, 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 let me, where do I want to go with this? According to the analysis, Erdogan's family's alleged wealth acquired through illegal means is managed by Bilal and that this is justified among religious circles as necessary for supporting global jihadist movements and Islamist regimes. Why does that intrigue me? Because it says in Daniel 11 regarding the Antichrist that he's in control of the treasuries of the gold and silver. He's the money manager. That's exactly what Bilal does. I'll be back with more folks. Stick around. <laughs> Everybody with me on on this late summer day. We're get almost into September time. A couple of more days. It's hard to believe. Time's flying by. But uh, I've only got a few minutes left, really, in this first hour of the broadcast. And I, I'm planning on I'm, I'm planning on wrapping this up into the second hour because there's some things I want to get into scripturally that that I need to get into. In the meantime, let me get to some of these broadcast notes the first hour of this broadcast will re-air at 3 p.m today on thursday and 1 p.m on saturday if you'd like to listen to the whole broadcast without it being um you know broken up into its various slots on the radio you can uh please subscribe to my youtube channel just look up andy white open up the doors on youtube as well as on rumble and we up we, we upload all these uh, videos. We archive them all over there it's for you to listen to them at, at your, you know, at your leisure. And also to please share around different platforms. It's all about getting the word out. We want those platforms, YouTube and, and, and Rumble. And I lean more on Rumble because I'm, I'm just, it's just working a lot better for my purposes. But please, when you do watch a video, whether it be on YouTube or Rumble or wherever you share it from, please hit the little thumbs up, that little like emoji that they have, because the more activity these platforms see given any uh, you know, video, the more it shows up in the streams, the more it shows up in the algorithms. And again, it's about getting the resource out there for people. So I would really appreciate it very much. Both, A, if you would subscribe to either channel, if you haven't, and also when you watch a video, to please hit that little thumbs up and leave a comment as well. Very few people leave comments. And, you know, if, if, you, if, you know, if you've got something nice to say, say it. If you've got something not so nice, just be polite, and I'll, I'll, I'll address your comments as well, your questions. So, again, you can please subscribe to my YouTube channel, my, my uh, Rumble channel. I also have a, a, a Open Up The Doors group page over on uh, Truth Social. It's an extension of, of this broadcast, and it's, it's an extension of what we do here, looking at the cultural issues, the the geopolitical situations from a biblical, uh, you know, worldview and eschatological f- frame, re- you know, frame reference. So if you'd like to be part of the group page on Truth Social, again, if you're on Truth, look it up, open up the doors. And, and that, that group is, is slowly but surely growing as well. It's not growing as fast as, uh, I would say, some of the more generic Christian sites on there. This is kind of a, 
It's definitely, and, and it can be. I want, I want, I want the body of Christ to come together in fellowship. You could post anything you'd like on the um, the open up the doors group page on Truth Social. Anything that's appropriate, of course. Um, but we do focus again on 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 the geopolitical scene and on eschatology. That's kind of our our uh, it's kind of our forte, so to speak. And I probably don't really like saying it like that, but that's what we tend to focus on. So I will be going to the phones uh, at some point in the second hour. I'm going to to uh, continue with the topic of the day once I once once the second hour begins because I got a whole other block of stuff that is extremely important regarding these things because I, I mentioned a moment ago that logics. I'm sorry, the logistics, the logistics and the infrastructure and the systems and the structures need to be in place before a lot of these prophetic events can be fully realized. And very few people, when it comes to end time prophecy, ever think about the logistics of the prophetic scriptures. I got a friend of mine, many of you know him, John Halla, who does a weekly prophetic update and one of the things he does he's one of the few people that does talk about regularly the logistics of how these things are, are to come about you know we talk about a lot of these things and people seem to think uh, almost uh they just seem to think that stuff's going to happen like out of the clear blue sky or overnight and it, it, that's not how it works there is a progression there is a marching forward there are things that are converging together but we've got to consider what the scriptures say and not just take scriptures out of context and, you know, take a verse out of context and say, you know, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet when it's not. It may be leading up to it, but it's not yet. It, 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 you know, it's not yet. The, the pieces are coming together. The, 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 the puzzle's coming together. But there are some things that have to be in place. Again, infrastructure and systems have to be in place, which aren't quite yet in place logistics infrastructure system and structures are very important to understand and very few people when it comes to end time prophecy ever think about the logistics of the prophetic scriptures in other words the things that must happen and take place before other things can happen and take place in order for prophecy to be fulfilled. And we need to understand this, clearly understand this, because this point is too often ignored or even thought about. So I want to say something, I want to sum something up, and I want to try to make it as concise and plain as simple, especially within the context of, of this broadcast. Hear me out very carefully. The Antichrist rises to power within a system that will already be in place when he comes into power. And that system is right now not in place. The pieces are all there, but it's not assembled yet. We're looking at a box filled with pieces of a puzzle. We, might, we know what the puzzle looks like because we got a picture of it on the cover of the box. The Bible tells us what it's going to look like. But right now, all we have is a box filled with pieces in the process of being fitted together. And one of the things that many of us do is we take one little piece of the puzzle out of the box, i.e. the Bible, and we stare at it and look at it. And then if something even remotely looks like that, we say, that's it, prophecies fulfilled. And this is that which was spoken of by the prophet. And no, it's not. Might be a piece of the puzzle. Clearly might be a piece of the puzzle. But it's not the whole picture yet. And it's not assembled yet. And I'm saying that for this, for this purpose. The Antichrist, the son of perdition, the king of the north, the man of lawlessness, the man of sin, Gog of Magog, who is the Antichrist. They're all different names and uh, descriptions of the final ultimate dictator. I titled this broadcast today, Who Will Be the Next Dictator? And it was kind of a play on words, really, W-H-O, who? Because I began the first hour, for those who missed it, talking about the plans that the 
WHO and the UN have. But there are steps in a process. And I'm seeing a lot of people saying, this is that, this is that, this is that. And no, not quite yet. It's not that. It's important. It's definitely precursors and foreshadowings, and they're important. They're important pieces to the puzzle, but it ain't the whole picture yet. And we need to understand this because if we don't, so much silliness and nonsense comes out of just grabbing a piece of the puzzle and trying to stick in some other piece that where it doesn't fit. Again, the Antichrist rises to power within a system that will already be in place when he comes into power. And that system right now is not in place. I know I'm repeating myself, but I want you to get this. The pieces are there, but it's not assembled yet. The Ten Nation Confederacy does not yet exist out of which the Antichrist will arise. That confederacy has to come first before we can even begin to talk about who the Antichrist might be. The Antichrist, again, the king of the north, the son of perdition, will not and cannot rise to power before a ten-nation confederacy exists, and it doesn't exist yet. The ten-nation confederacy that I keep referring to, it's the ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's dream statue in Daniel chapter 2. It's the ten horns of the fourth beast in Daniel 7. It's the same thing, different different dreams, different prophecies, but talking about a different picture of the same thing. Ten toes, ten horns on the beast in, in Daniel 7. There are ten horns on the beast in Revelation. This ten-horned beast must already exist and be in place before, capitalize those words, before the Antichrist comes to power. The scripture is so clear. I don't know how we missed this. The Bible tells us that we're going to go to the verses. The Bible tells us that the king of the north, the Antichrist, will subdue three horns or kings within that alliance that already exists because they seem to oppose him. And he does so in order to consolidate and secure his power over that kingdom. He's the little horn that comes up in the midst of of 10 other horns and we can read this plainly and clearly in daniel chapter 7 uh let me let me go through uh daniel 7 7 through 8 as well as 19 through 21 daniel 7 7 through 8 is the vision of the fourth beast and daniel says this he was he says this daniel 7 7 i was considering the horns and there was another horn a little horn coming up among them now, he says he's considering the horns. If you back up, I don't want to read the whole thing, but it, it was ten horns. It was a beast with ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. You see, they preexisted him. Before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man. And a mouth speaking pompous words. Here we begin. We begin to be, we begin to get the the first inklings of this final dictator, this final king. And then in Daniel chapter seven verses nineteen through twenty, Daniel explicitly asked Gabriel, who's giving him the interpretation. Daniel says this to Gabriel. Then I wished to know, or he makes the statement rather, then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured and broke in pieces and trampled the residue with its feet and the ten horns which were on its head and the other horn which came up before which three fell. You see, the Antichrist is an eleventh horn. Uh, let's go back. He, he, the, this beast trampled and the residue with his, his feet, verse 20 of Daniel 7, and the ten horns which were on its head and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. And Daniel says, I was watching. And the same horn, that little horn that came up, 
that 11th horn that overthrew three was making war against the saints. Funny we read that in Revelation 17 and 18 and 13. I was watching that horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until, until the ancient of days came and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Everything that's laid out in Revelation comes out from Daniel, from Jeremiah, from Isaiah, from Zechariah. And I've often said you cannot even begin to understand the book of Revelation if you do not understand the prophecies that are its framework and undergirding foundation. This Antichrist, he's the 11th king, the 11th horn of Daniel 7.24. Daniel 7.24, the angel Gabriel is now explaining to Daniel Remember, he said, I was considering, and and I wanted to know, tell me about these horns. I don't understand this, Gabriel. And then Gabriel answers Daniel, and he says this, The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, that last day's confederacy, that fourth beast. And another shall rise after them. You see, he's the eleventh. He shall be different from the first one's and he shall subdue three kings. I mean, the vision is blatantly and plainly being interpreted and explained to Daniel, which John picks up in Revelation, which we'll get to in a moment. And this little horn, this 11th horn, shall be different from the first ones, and he shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, time, and half a time. John blatantly quotes this in the book of Revelation. This is the great tribulation. Time, times, and half a time. The last three and a half years when the Antichrist sets himself up and speaks those pompous words against the Most High God, sets himself up on the Temple Mount, very possibly in front of or in the temple, a rebuilt temple. That, that may be debatable. There's actually a temple there. So we, we, we can go back and forth on that point. But they don't necessarily need to have a temple. They can have a tabernacle. I mean, they can, they can have a tent as long as they're over the rock of Ornan. I've talked about that in the past, so I don't want to digress too much. But the point is this. The Antichrist will stand on in the holy place. Jesus, in the book of Mark, talks about when you see the abomination standing where it ought not to stand. Jesus didn't even say the temple in that passage. Though Paul does say the temple in, specifically in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. So, again, th- th- there is this back and forth we can have of what exactly uh, constitutes a rebuilt temple or if Paul's using the, the term temple simply as a, as a euphemism to mean the holy place. The entire Temple Mount is the holy place. So I don't want to get, I don't want to digress too much. The point is this. The Antichrist will stand up in the middle of the week and break the covenant that he set in motion three and a half years before that. The Great Tribulation begins at that moment in time when he seeks to completely and utterly annihilate the Jews and the Christians. And we read about that again in, 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 Dan, in, in Revelation chapter 12. But all of this goes back to Daniel right there. It's plainly spelled out. No guesswork is needed. Again, it's exactly what Revelation 17, 10 through 14 speaks of. It's the same thing. John adds some added information where he talks about not just the, the ten horns, but the seven heads, seven kingdoms that have risen up. And he says there, which again is, is, is within the framework of Daniel, he says that the eighth king of Revelation 17 rises to power out of the already existing confederacy. 
Je- uh, Revelation uh, seventeen twelve through 14 says this. The ten horns. Now, remember what, the, what Gabriel said to uh, Daniel in Daniel chapter 7? It's like the same language. It's not like the same language. It is the same language. Now the, 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 the revelation, the vision is being explained to John on the island of Patmos. And the angel says, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as of yet. That is Daniel, plain and simple. And I want to emphasize, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as of yet. You know what, folks? That as of yet, it's still standing. The Ten Nation Confederacy has not risen as of yet. But they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind. They will give their power and their authority to the beast. Well, at least seven of them will. (laughs) Three of them will will have to be enforced, let's say. And these will make war with the Lamb again. That was Daniel. He shall make war against the saints of the Most High. So then, here's the takeaway of all this that we need to clearly understand. I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. The Antichrist comes into power from an already existing alliance of confederacies and takes control of it. He doesn't create it. Everyone's wondering, well, this guy's the Antichrist right now, and that guy's the Antichrist. Who is it? And you know what? They might be. But their time is not yet. Before the Antichrist can even be known, a confederacy must already exist of which he rises from within. So we need to be doing more. And here's where I want to go with this. We're talking about logistics and infrastructure and structures. What we need to be doing more than completely and totally looking for the coming of the Antichrist right now and trying to guess who it might be, which is an exercise in futility at the moment. What we really need to be keeping an eye on is the geopolitical maneuverings of the nations and the confederacies and the alliances that are coming together from which the Antichrist will arise. That's something I try to do on this broadcast for the last nine years. That's why I'm so interested in the geopolitical machinations and maneuverings of men and of nations, because I inherently and intrinsically understand this. There are certain things that must happen first before other things can happen. It's called logistics, to quote my friend John Howell. And too many people within the church, too many people get it completely backwards. They get it, they flip it the other way around. And again, that leads to all kinds of silliness and nonsensical conjectures. Now, we talk about the tribulation as being seven years. And again, some of that language is a little loosey-goosey. I understand what we're saying, but it, it, it reflects back to what is known as Daniel's 70th week. Daniel's 70th week is what is commonly referred to as the tribulation period, which will last seven years. But the first three and a half years are relatively calm. The first three and a half years are there is a a fake and phony peace treaty with Israel so that so that so this the sense of the sense of uh, peace and security is in the very beginning so it's the great tribulation the great tribulation does not begin until again three and a half years in when he breaks that covenant and now let me back this up this 70th week this seven year period that Daniel talks about cannot begin I hear people all the time, we're already in the tribulation. We're, no, we're not. We're in the time of, let's say, the beginning of sorrows. I've said that many times. People ask me all the time, are we in the tribulation yet? Nope, we're not there yet. Because the tribulation period, and I, let me say Daniel's 70th week, because that's really more accurate. The 70th week of Daniel cannot begin until the son of perdition, who is the king of the north, who, 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 has, who has taken control of, He has now risen up. This 11th horn has now risen up amongst the 10. He's taking control. And that guy, that dude, that final dictator, confirms a covenant with the many, and specifically with Israel, 
which he will then break in the middle of the week, as I've been explaining. So here's the point. When that covenant or treaty is ratified by the Antichrist, that is when we know the seven years begins. It doesn't begin because Benjamin Netanyahu and, 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 and Mohammed bin Salman sign a peace agreement. That's not it yet. Now, the Abraham Accords, now, like, that might be a precursor. That might be the framework that the Antichrist will affirm and confirm. But it's not it yet. I hope, you, I hope I'm making this clear to you. Too many people, they, they rush ahead. They want to rush ahead of what God's doing. Logistics, infrastructures, and structures are important for the fulfillment of prophecy. The Bible says, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son to be born of a virgin. The prophecy was given 700 years in Isaiah 7, 14. There was a sign for, for, for King uh, Ahaz, that, that, that the virgin would conceive. And in that case, it was, there was a shadowy fulfillment of Isaiah's children, his, Isaiah's wife bearing, bearing children. That, that was the literal sign to Ahaz because it was supposed to happen within two years. But we know that that precursor, that foreshadowing, that prefigurement was not the thing, the ultimate thing. It was an immediate thing for, for, for King Ahaz and Israel. But the ultimate thing happened in 700 years later, in the fullness of times, God sent forth the Son. And we need to understand the prophetic, the prophetic paradigm in these last days is that in the fullness of times, certain things will be and must be done. This covenant that comes into play, that the Antichrist signs and confirms in, in Daniel 11, it's not just any old treaty israel has entered into many treaties they thought that it was the treaty when sadat and menachem begum signed back in 1980 or 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 the oslo accords or they're all treaties they're all they're all heading somewhere but that wasn't that which was spoken by the prophet it's not just any old treaty that starts daniel's 70th week because Daniel is very plain about it. Go back and read it in Daniel chapter 9. It's a treaty, a covenant that he, the Antichrist himself, confirms and inaugurates. Which means he has to be here and in charge. And that hasn't happened yet. So when people say, and I've heard some people say this. So when people say that the UN Charter that I talked about in the first hour makes a peace agreement next year or a treaty next year, that that's going to be it. That's it. That's the, that's the covenant with many. I'm sorry, it's not. Again, it might be a precursor, but it's not yet ready. Not unless a 10-nation confederacy pops up on the scene within the next year, and that's possible. I will grant you that is possible. But the confederacy has to be here first, and the Antichrist has to subdue three of those kingdoms first. That hasn't happened yet. When is going to happen? I don't know. How soon is it going to happen? Well, it might happen in a year or two. Things, things are moving along pretty quickly. But we need to watch for the proper things. So when, the, when people say, again, I'll repeat it, that this UN Charter, this peace agreement, is the covenant with many, no, it's not. Until the Antichrist himself affirms and confirms it, it's not yet that which was spoken of by the prophet. So folks, I'm going to go to a break soon, but I'm going to wrap this up with this. We need to be watching as these things come together, keeping an eye on them because, as I said a moment ago, these things are, they, things can happen quickly. They are happening quickly. But this is all the more reason we need to be paying attention to these geopolitical movements. I set up in the first block of the first hour a lot of people ignore these things they're ignoring what erdogan wants to do with his son Bilal. who cares oh huh. it could be significant it could be very significant especially when you look at the, how the antichrist rises to power out of almost uh almost out of ambiguity no one's ever heard of hardly anybody's ever heard of Bilal erdogan maybe he will be again i'm not going to say he is 
I'm just looking at some patterns and some characteristics of how the king of the north comes to power. And this whole situation with Bilal Erdogan is very intriguing. That's all I'm going to say regarding that. It may not be at all, but it's something to be watching. The treaty with, with Netanyahu and MBS is something to be watching. Because we need to be paying attention. Because the, 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 these are some of the things I've, I've been saying for many years now. That there are all these conflicting agendas. These conflicting things that overlap. These different personalities. Erdogan, as I said in the first hour, he wants to be the ruler. He wants to be the caliph of of uh, of uh, Islamic caliphate. And maybe he realizes he's getting too old, so now he's going to raise up his son. But MBS, who's very young, this MBS is very intriguing to me. I don't believe, I do not believe because of the way Scripture talks about the king of the north and the Antichrist. I do not believe for a moment that MBS is the Antichrist. But again, he displays some very interesting Antichrist-like char- uh, characteristics. He's charismatic. He's actually a very handsome man. Um, he, he's, 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 a, he's a geopolitical mover and shaker. But he's not the king of the north. Because the Bible explicitly says it's the king of the north. He's a king of the south, which will be defeated by the Antichrist. So again, I'm looking at these things and I'm pondering them, pondering them. Because they're all, all of these overlapping and different personalities. They're all vying for the same position of hegemony and control because it's all about their power. So that inherently they will be at war with each other, which is exactly what Daniel 11 talks about all of the military campaigns of the Antichrist as he rises to power, as he comes into power, as he's in power. Again, there's this idea that the Antichrist conquers the whole world. That's not biblical. That's pop eschatology. It it just really is. But I won't digress. It's 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 an Islamic caliphate. It would be a sultan's desire. It's, It's it's Islamic theology to conquer the whole world. But they never quite get there. Remember, the kings of the east, the north, the kings of the east come against the Antichrist. So obviously he's not controlling the whole world. The kings of the east, oh, I, I don't want to digress too much. I want to focus on this right now. Because some of these things are coming to pass right now. But we need to understand that all of these, uh, these multilateral positioning of hegemonies and, and control. It's all about power. People, they're, they're all megalomaniacs. <laughs> they're all to some degree, you know, super narcissistic. But they will inherently be at war with each other because they're all vying for the same thing. Even when they're feigning friendship, even though when they're, like a, a few months ago, it, it was like the world was rocked that, that uh, Saudi Arabia was making some kind of, a, uh, of an agreement with Iran. They're mortal enemies. And I was like, what, what is this all about? And I said, whatever it's about, it's going to be short-lived. Because the Bible says it's going to be short-lived. This is clearly what passages like Daniel chapter 11 and Revelation, as I just mentioned ago, Joel chapter 3 talk about prophesying the gathering of the nations together for one final conflict with Israel being ground zero. And to be sure, and I'm going to wrap this up right here and then go to a song break and you can call in. But let me wrap it up with this. There can be no doubt that the powers and principalities and the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly realms and the spirit of Antichrist are all working together even now to bring the whole infrastructure and system together. Everything that is needed is there. Again, the puzzle pieces just need to be put together. The geopolitical forces are right now at work. That will cause the final beast to rise up out of a confederacy that must pre-exist him. So let's look for that first. But the man who will rise up out of the midst of that confederacy through political intrigue and through geopolitical machinations, I'm quite sure is already lurking somewhere in the shadows. That's all she wrote, folks. Time to fly, but keep it right here on Faith FM. Be bold, be strong, let everything that you do be done in love. Stand firm in the faith. Keep it right here on Faith FM, and I'll be back next week.